How's it going? So this video is a really a reflection of my PhD thesis at Stanford, where I was involved in uh, building a hardware compiler for image processing and machine learning algorithms expressed in Halide, and also worked on some other similar projects like Aetherling. And I just wanted to compress some of the stuff that I've learned, and hopefully uh, other people interested in building hardware compilers will find it useful. So the goal in projects like this is to build a compiler that can translate architecture agnostic descriptions of machine learning and image processing algorithms into hardware accelerators. So the input to the compiler is an application written in TensorFlow, PyTorch, Halide, TBM, name your favorite framework for expressing dense linear algebra. And that gets sent into a hardware compiler. And the hardware compiler emits a hardware accelerator for that application written in Verilog or VHDL that can be mapped to an FPGA or actually fabricated into an ASIC for the application. And the number one thing that I can say, having seen a bunch of these different projects using many different backends and many different front ends targeting many different architectures, is that you want to use high level synthesis as a backend. So rather than having the hardware compiler go all the way to Verilog, it's much, much easier to have the hardware compiler emit HLS C code with pragmas and directives to tell the uh, high level synthesis tool how to generate memories and so forth, and then send that to your target platform's HLS tool. Most of them have them have them now. You know, if you're targeting Xilinx FPGAs, you can use Vivado. If you're targeting something from Intel, you can use Intel HLS. If you're an academic, you can use Leg Up, or uh, you know, if you're targeting the ASIC, you can use Catapult. So you do lose something when you do when you target HLS. You don't get complete control, uh, but the improvement in productivity is absolutely tremendous. And if you can't get it work, the compiler working generating HLS, there's no way you're going to get working with RTL. So even if you want to squeeze out that last little bit of improvement from using your own custom RTL, uh, you should probably start with high-level synthesis. The next part is about the front end, which is that. In a lot of these kinds of applications, there's a few decisions that affect the actual semantics, the output result of the running the program, like quantization and bit width tuning, right? So there's a lot of optimizations like memory banking that, you know, if you make bank a memory one way or another way, the application type might take more time or less time. You might get higher throughput or lower throughput, but the output of the application is going to be the same. Whereas with op optimizations like quantization in a neural network or adjusting the bit width of a certain uh, arithmetic operator in the design, that's actually going to affect the results that you get when you run your program. And I think it's a good idea to put any optimizations that affect semantics, that affect the output of the program, like quantization and bit width tuning at the front end. And then the other important point is that it's a good idea, at least at the front of the hardware compiler, to use for loops as an intermediate representation as well as an output target for HLS. So applications like TensorFlow, or excuse me, frameworks like TensorFlow, PyTorch, Halide, and TBM, as I said before, are basically frameworks for writing dense linear algebra. They're frameworks for writing programs that iterate over tensors in a dense way, uh, updating the values of you know uh, elements stored in multidimensional arrays, and actually Halide and TBM. Uh, just de-sugar directly into for loops. So they're a really nice intermediate representation and using for loops lets you come closer to the output of uh, that you're going to use, which is HLS. And they also give you access to a ton of uh, knowledge about software optimization, much of which carries over into hardware. So the core of the hardware compiler is going to map programs expressed as architecture agnostic for loops into HLS C++. And that's great news because HLS C++ can handle for loops already, so you could just theoretically get a working hardware compiler by taking in a bunch of loops and then emitting the loops as C++ code, just putting in some, uh, you know, of maybe a few more curly braces here and there to get a legal C++, and you're done. The bad news is that the performance is going to be absolutely terrible if you send unoptimized for loops to an HLS tool. So let's look at an example. Like, suppose we're doing a one-dimensional convolution on an input followed by a nonlinear operation like a ReLU. So in this first loop nest for i in 1 to 10, we're going to initialize the value of bi, which is our intermediate convolution result. We're going to do a 3 by 1 convolution to uh, set the value of bi, and then we're going to output uh, this uh, rectified linear unit applied to bi. So this input's already HLS compliant output, right? Uh, as long as we wrap this in a function declaration and include the declaration of bi and uh, kernel and in and out as arguments to the function, we can just send this straight to an HLS tool and get code. Of course, the problem is that our loops won't be pipelined, so our utilization is going to be absolutely terrible, right? We're going to start, uh, you know, a new iteration of, for example, the inner kernel loop. Uh, maybe we'll do it one cycle, depends on how uh, what the latency of the multiply and the add are. And, you know, we're not going to pipeline the use of the ReLU either, so we're going to get terrible utilization. Well, there's an easy fix, which is we can add pipeline directives to the inner loops, right? We could say pound pragma HLS pipeline ii equals 1 to each of these loops to improve our uh, utilization. Then, of course, there's another problem, which is bad locality, right? So 
if you think about it, we're producing this entire 10 entry B loop and then applying a nonlinear pointwise function to each of the entries of the B loop. So we've got to instantiate a length 10 array to store the intermediate results of this loop before it's used in the second loop. But actually we could compute this value, value right after we've computed BI and then shrink the resulting array. So the solution here is loop fusion, right? So let's push the two different loops together into a single loop with uh, trip count 10, compute an entry of BI and then compute the corresponding output. There's an alternative way to express this kind of locality improvement too, and, and the uh, contrast between loop fusion and what I'm going to call process splitting is something that will go throughout these videos, which is another way to improve locality is to leave this as two separate loop nests, but then have them communicate through an HLS stream, which really represents a FIFO or a ready valid channel, and then tell the uh, HLS tool to make this a data flow architecture, which will put this for loop and this for loop into separate modules that communicate through this FIFO. And uh, this will also achieve the uh, same result, but it won't put the same burden on the HLS scheduler to schedule a loop of the same size uh, or of the larger fused loop. And uh, of course, in this implementation, you might notice it's, it's obvious that C should have depth two, uh, the minimum depth needed to get to a full throughput pipeline. But in general, when you do this kind of process splitting solution where you break up different loop nests and have them communicate through channels in the hope of getting better concurrency, you do actually have to do some non-trivial reasoning to figure out how large streams will be. There's another problem, and let's just suppose we're going to go with the fused solution just to simplify the code for a second, which is underutilized functional units. So even in this fused loop nest, we don't have to store as much of B now, um, but we're still doing three iterations of this loop for every one ReLU that we do. So if we have enough area, what we'd really like to do is unroll the inner loop uh, and then pipeline this outer loop so that uh, you know, we'll stamp out three multipliers and three adders and then we'll, we'll uh, you know, compute one output of B and one ReLU output on that uh, every single cycle in a pipeline fashion. But now in order to pipeline, it's not so easy because in order for this pipeline to reach an initiation interval of one, we have to do three reads from the input array. Uh, but a typical, for example, uh, you know, FPJ BRAM might only have uh, one read port and one write port and actually an SRAM on an ASIC might only have one port period. So we need a higher bandwidth from input than we probably have in uh, the basic memory primitives that are available on the target architecture. And the solution here uh, is to bank the input cyclically modulo three in this case, so that uh, every value, so that uh, I zero plus zero will be in a different bank of in from I plus one and I plus two, and that will allow us to uh, issue a new iteration of this loop on every clock cycle. And now, of course, we can actually shrink B into a scalar, as I've been talking about, because we have higher locality, which means that we actually only need uh, one value of B for each of these loop iterations at a given time. We don't need to store a large array of B values. And now we've got a much more optimized implementation that can produce one output pixel every clock cycle. So as we just talked about, uh, that was kind of a whirlwind tour of the types of optimizations you do. And if you think about these two different types of optimizations, they or these optimizations you've looked at, they fall into two big categories, loop transformations that change the structure of the program or the schedule, the order of events in the program, and memory optimizations, things like banking and shrinking of memories that change uh, the implementation of the multidimensional arrays in the input program. And in my experience, a pretty good way of building hardware compilers is to break up the compiler into two steps. Loop transformations like fusion, process splitting, unrolling, and tiling that change the order of events in the program to improve locality, and then emit better for loops, and then do memory optimizations where we figure out how to implement each multidimensional array in the program by banking and shrinking the arrays appropriately to service the bandwidth that's needed by whatever the improved loop schedule uh, produced by loop transformations was. Now you might ask, why not simultaneously optimize loops and memories? There's no reason necessarily why you couldn't uh, simultaneously or even in some kind of backtracking fashion try different loop transformations and try memory optimizations and maybe go back if you don't like the solution and so on. Why this uh, just linear pipeline structure rather than something more complex? And my experience is that you can try something more complex, but it's just too hard and the payoff usually isn't very high, especially at the start of a project. And so Really, uh, if you're starting to build a uh, hardware compiler from scratch, it's much, much, much better to come up with a linear pipeline that produces suboptimal results in some cases, but that does a decent job. And I think that this structure where you come up with a new with a schedule and then optimize memories for that schedule or for that order of events uh, is uh, you know a very nice place to start. And if you get that working with really high reliability, then you can try to uh, do something more sophisticated. 
other thing you might ask is why not optimize the memory designs before the loop transformations? So if we're going to do things in some linear order, one after another, why not put memory optimization before loop transformation? And the answer is that to know how to bank and size memories, really you need to know the order of events in the program. Most memory optimizations have something to do with exploiting the locality inherent in the order of events in the program. And in order to do that, you have to know what the order of events is, which means you have to have already done all of the loop transformations that you're going to do. So hopefully that was an interesting uh, whirlwind tour of the high-level architecture of a hardware compiler. And if you were interested, I'll go into some more detail on each of those steps in the next video.